Hi all, this is the badging video for the pottery area here at Make Haven. So first we're going to do a quick tour of the area to see all the bits and pieces of this, this little pottery corner. Right here we have the wedging table. So wedging is when you knead clay to get rid of the bubbles in it. Before you use the wedging table to wedge your clay, you want to make sure that it's nice and clean because if there are dry bits of clay on there, then they'll work into your clay and that'll be really annoying to have dry clumps of clay in your clay when you're trying to work with it. So make sure to wipe it off first. You can use a wet sponge if you want to just to make sure it's nice and clean. So we have clay for sale in our store in the back of Make Haven. And for now, that's the only clay that we're going to use in this area. So super convenient. Uh, you can just get it from the back. You can, if you want, get more of that clay for your own use if you want to use a whole bunch of it. Um, it is sold as Liz's Light on Sheffield Potter's website. It's a Cone 6 clay. It's a stoneware and it has medium grog in it. And grog is stuff that helps make it easier to shape the clay with your hands because it has a little bit of grit in it. So when you first get the clay, you're going to want to make sure there's no bubbles in it because the bubbles will explode in the kiln. It'll break your, your whatever you're making. So you'll bring it over here to the wedging table. There's a wire here that you can use to cut it into smaller pieces, which can be helpful. Um, and then you wedge it like you're, you're kneading bread. You can watch all kinds of tutorial videos on that if you're not familiar on YouTube. And the goal of that, again, is just to, to, work, to work out the clay. Uh, you can also re-wedge clay. So after you have made something, you have some trimmings, and you want to use those trimmings and make a new ball of clay, you can re-wedge them on the wedging table to get it back to be nice, fresh, usable clay. We also have a scale here for weighing, which we'll get back to later when you might need to weigh things. Uh, and then as with all the pottery area and all the make haven, when you're done using the tool, you need to clean it up. For the wedging table, um, especially when you're done, it'll have a, a film of clay on it. And the clay, when it dries, will become really dusty and the clay dust floating around is dangerous to people's lungs it can cause silicosis over time so it's important to clean it up you just take a sponge from the blue bucket with water there you can fill it up at the sink if you need to and wipe it down to make sure that there is no dry clay left on the wire on the top on, you know in, in the area and if there's stuff on the floor then we have a mop hanging on the wall that you can use to mop up the floor uh, also, if you're using the scale, make sure to clean it off before and after you're using it. So here we have the shelves for the pottery area, and we'll go down top to bottom. So the top are just extra tools, you shouldn't need to worry about those. Here are some useful things. So starting on the right is wax resist. We'll get to this later when you are glazing your work. Here are just some, some basic tools, some sponges and hand tools, wires. Here are cookies, and this is what you put your work on when it goes in the kiln to protect the shelves from your work. And then here are bats, which go on our pottery wheel so that you can make things on them and then take them on and off easily. On this shelf, we have fired items ready to be picked up. So when something comes out of the kiln, it goes on this shelf for you to either glaze uh, or to take home. And they can only stay here for a week. After that, they get tossed. So make sure to pick them up. Cone six items ready to be fired. So after you have uh, made your, your piece of pottery and it's totally dry, then it's okay to put on the shelf. And then when someone's doing a firing, you it can it will then go into the kiln. It's important to make sure that your stuff is labeled on you know when you put it on the shelf. So it may not be labeled when it goes on the to be picked up shelf because it's just coming out of the kiln. But every other time you should print out a label from the label maker and put it on there so we know whose it is. And if it's been there for more than a week, it's gone. These are cone six glazed items ready to be fired. So this is after something has already been bisque fired and then you've glazed it and it's ready to be glazed fired. Then it can hang out on this shelf until someone's doing a firing. And then these last two are drying shelves. So down there is where you can keep your work while it's in progress or when it's drying. And there are fans if you want it to dry faster, plastic if you want to cover it. And as I said earlier, make sure that it's labeled so that uh, everyone knows whose it is. Here in this bucket, we have some kiln wash. And kiln wash is what you put on the cookies and on the furniture. 
the shelves within the kiln so that if any glaze or molten clay drips, it can come off on the wash and not melt into the, the kiln and the kiln furniture, which would ruin them. So that's important to brush on. Down here we have a bucket for trimmings. So if you aren't collecting your own trimmings, you just want to toss in the bucket, then you can put them in there and someone else can re-wedge it and make that clay usable again. And here we just have a bucket of clear glaze. So we may get more glazes over time. You're welcome to bring your own if they're cone six glazes. Uh, but this is just clear glaze for people to use. It's $1.50 per pound of clay. So you weigh your piece on the scale on the wall, and then you can go to makehaven.org slash store to pay for the that glaze that you've used. Um, this piece of wood in the floor is just covering a, a sump pump, so you don't need to worry about that. And we have a little stool reaching the shelves. On the wall here, we have some other tools. So starting from the left, you have a wax brush. This is for brushing the wax resist on your pieces. A kiln wash brush for brushing the kiln wash onto cookies or the shelves. The mop, this is for stirring the glaze. Uh, just to make sure to rinse it off when you're done, but this is just for stirring the glaze around. Uh, we have gloves, so when you're taking your work out, it might still be warm to the touch. Um, it will, you should only open the kiln once it's under 150 degrees, so it won't be scalding hot. You might still want to use the gloves. And then this is a mixer for mixing up glaze and kiln wash and stuff like that. Over here, we have dunking tools. So these you can use for dunking your work into the glaze when you are glazing them. And then over here on the wall, we have the switch for the fan. So our kiln has a downdraft vent, and it's important to make sure the fan is on and actively venting, because when, when your pottery is baking, you don't want the fumes and smoke and whatnot to go into the room. You want it to get sucked outside. So you'll just turn this on so that the little, you might not be able to hear it, but this little fan is now blowing the air out. And then you can turn it off when you're done. Here we have some chalk to write on the kiln sign. So when you are firing, it's important to put the sign on here so that everyone else knows that it's hot and they shouldn't touch it. And then you can just write with the chalk when it's gonna be cool so that you and others know when it will be okay to touch and empty the kiln. Here we have a tablet, and this is where you're gonna put in the information about the firing, so it keeps the kiln log. Um, we have to pay for the firings, and so that is how we keep track of it in here. This is Erica, the lovely facilitator for the pottery area. And these are stilts. So stilts are what the shelves, which sometimes live on here, uh, rest on. So we'll look in there later. And then last but not least, we have the actual wheel. So for the wheel, uh, we have the foot pedal down here. And this is what you use to make the wheel go and stop. There's a power switch right in here, so when you click that, it's now on. Uh, when you're done, make sure to turn it off so if someone's running around and steps on the pedal to accident, the wheel doesn't start spinning. When you turn it on and you push the pedal, the wheel goes, which is pretty cool. Make sure to work on bats. So the bats live right up here, and these, these bats... All right, so the bats are what you use to actually make your work on. And the reason for that is it makes it really easy when you're done to take it off and put it over to dry or then to work on it later if you want it. Uh, the, um, on the bats, it has these little lumps right on the edges, and that's just to help you find the pins. So you can go like that and place it right on the pins on the wheel and so now your, your bat is on there. As with wedging, you can speak to the facilitators and watch all kinds of YouTube videos on throwing techniques. That's where a lot of the skill is in pottery is learning how to, how to throw. Uh, so we're not going to get into that here. In terms of safety on the wheel, the two things to be aware of are one, making sure that you don't have any hair or jewelry or sleeves that might get caught on your workpiece or on the wheel. Um, it could mess up your piece for one, but also if it really got caught, it could pull you in and be dangerous. So make sure to you know, not have any dangly things that might get caught on the work. Uh, and then the other most important thing is cleaning up when you're done. So again, you don't have clay dust all over the place. So you're just gonna take a sponge and dunk it in the water and make sure to wipe everything off. So for cleaning up, there are these tabs on the sides. So you pull those tabs and then the trays come off. And you can 
bring them over to the slop sink and rinse them out, wash them out. When you're cleaning this out, if there are any big chunks of clay that have fallen in, you can put them into a trimming bucket. If there's just some sloppy clay, small pieces, then if you can put them in the blue bucket, that is perfect because it'll settle out and you can scoop that out. Uh, and then if there's really just like, you know, dirty water, it can go into the slop sink. The slop sink has a bin underneath it to catch some of the clay so that it doesn't go down into the sewage system. Uh, but we want to capture as much of that as possible before it gets to the sink. So once it's all clean, we can put this right back in here and slide it forwards and then clip this back in, just like that. So when you're done cleaning up the pottery wheel, this is how it should look, uh, all nice and shiny clean, because otherwise you're just leaving a bunch of dust to blow around in the air and little bits of clay to get in the next person's work that they'll just have to clean up. When you are done, you can take your fat off and put it on the shelf to dry with a label. Uh, once it has gotten to the leather hard stage, so that means it feels a little bit like leather and is more dry, then you can trim your piece. And so you can put it back on the wheel and you know, trim to the final trimming however you want and then remove it from the bat. So then you can, once it's removed from the bat, then you can put it back on the drying shelf wash off your bat and put it away, and then wait for the piece to get bone dry. So after your piece has dried to leather hard and you've trimmed it and then removed it from the bat, put it on the shelf to dry more. Hopefully about a week later, it'll be bone dry. It'll be a little lighter in color and also way less because the water is evaporated and it won't feel cool to the touch because when you touch something there's water in it, it feels cool because that water is conducting your heat. But once it's totally dry, then it doesn't really feel cool to the touch anymore. So you know, this is an example, and when you feel the back of a cookie, you can feel the way that it feels is somewhat similar. So one way of telling if your piece is really bone dry, and as a note, it's important that it is really bone dry before it goes into the kiln, because if there's still water in it, it will explode when it goes in the kiln. So that's why it's important that it is really truly dry. Uh, so you, you can feel it to see if it doesn't feel cool to the touch anymore, the color has changed, and in terms of the weight, what you can do is put your piece on the scale after you've trimmed it. So you have the scale over there, you can weigh it, and then you can weigh it a week later, and it should have lost about 10% of its weight. So for now, we'll say that it needs to have lost at least 8% of its weight to be considered bone dry. So let's say you had a piece that weighed one pound after you trimmed it when it was leather hard, then when it's done, it should weigh about point nine two pounds when you put it on the scale because it's lost eight percent of that weight and then if it hasn't then just let it dry some more you can try using the fan if you want it to dry faster uh, there's some fans here and that's how we make sure that things are really truly dry before going in the kiln if it's not again it could explode which would ruin your piece as well as other people's pieces The stages of the clay, while it's still what's called greenware, which is before it's been fired, are plastic, which is like fresh clay out of the bag, and that's when it's still wet and you can easily change its shape. And then there's leather hard, which you know you can't really shape it with your hands anymore, like you think of this fresh clay, um, but you can still trim it and cut it. You know, it doesn't just like shatter. And then finally is bone dry, and bone dry is when you know if you drop it, it shatters. It's it's totally dry. There's no you can't you know trim it or do something like that anymore. The next step after your piece is totally bone dry, and you put it onto the cone six items ready to be fired bisque shelf, is that when there are enough pieces there, you or someone else can put the pieces in the kiln to fire them. Uh, so now we'll look at the steps of doing that in the kiln. So to cover some basic information, the way that we measure the, what kind of firing is happening in the kiln is by using a system that's called cones. The idea of cones comes from these little things called pyrometric cones, and they go in the kiln, uh, especially in older kilns, they would go inside and indicate how much heat had been put into the work. So a cone isn't just an indication of temperature. A cone is also an indication of how much temperature and how long a piece has been fired for. 
So if you have a piece and you put it in at 1800 degrees, for example, just for a minute, then this cone might not fall over. It might not you know, bend over because it got heated up that much. Um, but if you put it in for five hours, then it would be a higher cone. So in that way, cone's a little bit complicated. Luckily, we have this fancy kiln with a digital screen and, and uses thermocouples to measure the temperature so we don't actually need to use the cones very often anymore. And in that way, you can do a really good job of making sure that just the right amount of heat is going to work. So with this kiln, uh, and in this pottery area in general, we're just using the clay that we have decided to use here just because it means that we don't have to worry about things mixing and melting and all kinds of problems that come with different kinds of clays. So all the clay is cone six clay, meaning it's final firing happens at cone six. The way that the cone scale works is it goes up to about 10 or 12 at the really hottest high end. And then as you go down, you actually go into negative cones and negative cones are written with a zero before it. So cone six is really super hot. Cone zero six is not so hot. Still obviously scorching hot, but much less hot than cone six. So it's sort of at a negative scale in that way. When you're using the kiln, it actually uses a lot of electricity. So this is, this is an electric kiln, which uses electric heating elements to heat up, and it uses a bunch of electricity, so that has a cost. The two firings that you do in the kiln are bisque firings and then glaze firings. So a bisque firing is used to a lower temperature, and that the purpose that is to drive out all the organic material in the clay and get it really super nice and dry and ready for the glaze firing. And that takes a longer amount of time. It's about 12 hours and it takes about 12 hours just to cool down. So it's about a whole day of just of, of firing. And so that uses more electricity. So it's about $10 to run a bisque firing cycle in the kiln. Uh, now, if you have a bunch of people's stuff in there, then it's split up between everyone. So it's not so expensive. If you just want to do your one mug, then that's going to be pretty expensive. So it's a good idea to leave it on the shelf until there's more people's work to get fired at the same time. For the glaze firing, that goes faster, even though it's hotter. And so it uses less electricity. So it's only about $5 for a firing. And we'll show you in a minute the kiln log so you can see exactly how that is recorded. In terms of some of the safety for the kiln, uh, it's Obviously a pretty big heavy duty machine, but it's not super strong. So you need to be pretty delicate with it and gentle. So for example, it has this big heavy lid. And when you lift it up, you need to make really sure that this catch is on here so the lid doesn't fall. And you don't want to lean on it or you know put stuff because it's actually pretty easy to damage these bricks. These are called refractory bricks on the side that can handle the heat. And if you like gouge them or hit them or crack them, then you know, we're in big trouble. So you really want to be nice and gentle with this. Um, obviously also gets very, very hot. So after you've turned the machine on and the lid is closed, you need to make sure you put the sign on it. So you would put this kiln sign on it and that's how everyone knows that it's hot and they shouldn't touch it. Um, the, everything about it is hot. So you just don't want to make sure that you don't touch it when it's on. It'll tell you the temperature on the front. So you can see when it's come down below 150 degrees and then it's safe to open up to get your stuff out. Something else is that when you are doing a firing, it releases gases. So you need to make sure that the fan is on. So right here we have this little switch. You just turn on and then it'll suck out all the fumes. One other thing is we have these peephole plugs and you wanna make sure that those are in the kiln when you're using it so the gases aren't escaping and the heat isn't escaping. It's all nicely contained in there. One other safety note is that when the kiln is on, the elements that run around the inside edge of this are electrically charged and will shock you if you touch them. So it's important for that reason also to make sure that this is closed when you are running the machine and to make sure that none of your pieces are close to the edge. So you should leave an inch or two around the edge uh, where your pieces are not so they can't accidentally touch the coils which would damage them and the coils, which are expensive and time consuming to replace. All right, so we'll look at the kiln log now. So to turn on the tablet, you just push this button twice and it opens up. And here you can see the sort of the system. So let's say we were doing a firing right now. You would just put in the date. Date, we'll just put July 26. And the person firing here is me and then the type of firing 
we're going to say is a bisque firing. The clay owners, so let's say I wasn't just putting my stuff in here, but there's actually four other people's stuff on the shelf that we were going to put in and fire at the same time. So any time that there is stuff on the shelf saying ready to be fired, it can go in. Now, if you notice that you think that something is not in fact bone dry, then you can put it back and maybe even put it back on a drying shelf because we really don't want to put anything in that isn't actually ready. Uh, and maybe even message that person on Slack and say like, hey, you know, I think this piece might not quite have been ready, so I put it back on the shelf to dry some more. But once it's really dry, then you can write the owners because each piece will be labeled. So you can write, you know, the names of the people whose stuff is going in there. So if we put three people, we could, you know, say one is Allie, and this is Frank, and this is Sarah's stuff, and then obviously I put my stuff in here too. One of the ways that you know that the piece is ready to be fired is because it's bone dry, and you've weighed it to know that it's lost 8% of its weight. And so when you're done, when it's on that ready to be fired shelf, you should write on your label the final weight of your piece. You'll also know that weight if you dunked it to be glazed because it's now going in for the glaze firing. So on that label should be written the weight. And let's say that, you know, Allie just had one piece and it was, it was one pound and then Frank had one that was two pounds and then Sarah had three pieces and they all added up to four pounds and then I had three pieces that added up to five pounds. Here, you can see that it figures out how much each person should pay. So it took that $10 bisque firing and split it up and said that Allie only needs to pay 83 cents because she just has one pound in there, but I need to pay the most of 417 because I have the most stuff in there. And then, so I can pay for my stuff right now because I know that I'm firing it. So I go to makehaven.org slash store and pay for the, for the kiln firing and I just put in 417 uh, and then I can put a Y right here and then what you could also do if you're feeling especially generous is message Allie, Frank and Sarah on Slack that their pieces are being fired and they can then pay here as well. Um, they'll also find out because they should be coming in to check on their pieces and then they'll see that their pieces are on the fired items to be picked up shelf and should know that they should now pay according to how much is in the log. And then for the next firing, you can just go down to the next section and the next section. And for each firing, make sure to put in all the information so that it's recorded and we make sure that the electrical cost of the kiln is getting paid for. So now we'll talk more about using the kiln itself. So um, a few notes, you can see the kiln wash on here. So the kiln wash is this white stuff in the bucket uh, with a little paintbrush on the wall for it. And before you use the kiln, if you see that there are any bare patches of kiln wash, then you want to make sure to paint more on there um, to protect it. Also, when you're done firing, and let's say it was a glaze firing, some glaze dripped off onto it, then it's important to remove that and repaint in that spot so that the shelf is protected. Uh, hopefully, when the glaze drips, up, hopefully if the glaze drips onto the kiln wash, it'll come off really easily and take the kiln wash with it. So then you just need to reapply it. Then something else is the kiln wash over time will get flaky. And so it's important to not put kiln wash on the bottom sides of the shelf because you don't want it to flake down onto your work underneath. So just keep it on the top and preferably keep it away from the edges so that it isn't flaking off the sides and definitely don't put any on the sides of the kiln because you don't want to get near the elements. When you are firing, make sure to put your, any of the work on cookies. So the cookies are the little kiln wash covered trays that we looked at on the shelf. And that's just to make sure that if for some reason the clay were to melt or the glaze were to drip, it protects the shelf even more. The shelves are pretty expensive and obviously the stone, the bricks around the sides are very expensive. So we want to make sure to keep them well protected. And then just as another note, we want to make sure that if you are using your own glazes, they are cone six glazes. When you're putting things in here, there are some techniques that people use that involve putting flammable things in the kiln, but we don't want to do that. Uh, we have a sprinkler head above this, so no, no funny business with putting straw or um, paper, plastic, anything in here besides the clay and the glaze. 
because that could make smoke and fumes and all kinds of problems that we don't, we don't want to deal with. When you're doing a bisque firing, so the bisque firing there's no glaze, it's just the pieces of bone dry pottery getting fired so that they are ready to get glazed, uh, it's okay for the pieces to touch. So you can stack bowls within each other, pieces can touch edge to edge, they're not going to stick together, it's, it's not a problem. When you're doing a glaze firing, uh, you need to make sure that none of the glazed pieces are touching each other because then they'll just fuse together and be one and you'll have to break them apart and grind it and it'll be a mess. So just as when you're glazing, you need to make sure that nothing drips onto the uh, onto your cookies or onto the shelves. You need to make sure they're not touching each other either. Uh, we'll go over a little later how to use the wax, the wax resist on your parts to make sure that the bottoms of it don't have any glaze on it because if they do, then they'll just glue right to your cookie, which you don't really want because then you have to grind it off and it's a mess. So now we can look down and, and take out these shelves to see what's going on in here. So the shelves live right up here. And when you're taking them in and out, you want to be careful to not hit the walls of the kiln because you'll damage them pretty easily. They rest on these stilts, and the stilts live right over here. So I'm just taking the rest of these stilts out so you can see down into the bottom of the kiln. And if you look down in here, you can see the thermocouple. And we want to make sure not to hit the thermocouple because that is how the kiln knows what temperature it's at. So we're going to take these out carefully. And you can see the bottom of this shelf is not glazed. So we're going to keep it that way. And I'm going to pull this out really carefully so we don't hit the thermocouple. And these stilts. And then the bottom most shelf, if you look down here, is resting on short one inch uh, little stilts and the purpose of that is so that the air can get down around it to the hole in the bottom that gets vented outside uh, and so that one we can just leave in place unless you want to take it out to put more kiln wash on it or something like that but in general that one can just stay down there so that it keeps the hole covered but not sealed up uh, so then when you load your pieces in you're trying to keep it balanced you don't want any of the shelves tipping or falling or anything like that uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you're bisque firing, it's okay to stack things, like pieces within each other. It's okay for them to touch. And then you just arrange these stilts and the shelves to get as many pieces in there as you can. Maybe we want a taller piece in the bottom now, so I'll take these out and swap them for the taller stilts. When you're putting things in here, again, make sure not to hit our thermocouple. And then something else to note is when you are putting the different layers of shelves in, you want the stilts to all line up from one layer to the next so that the weight is transferred evenly down. Because if you have it sitting like that, then with all that heat going on, it's possible for those shelves to warp when they're under pressure twisting it. But if they're right up and down, there's nothing trying to get those shelves to twist. So then we'll load it right back up. Then once the shelves are in, you can put in more of the pottery and more of the stilts, etc. until it's full. Or if you had some tall things, then you don't need to fill it all the way up with the shelves and the stilts. You could, you know, put your tall items in there. The idea is just to arrange it however makes sense for whatever you're firing. We'll mention this again in a little bit when we look at the glazes, but when you're firing glazed things, you want to wait at least an hour after you've glazed it before putting it in. You want some of that water to get absorbed and to evaporate so that it isn't, you know, it has less of a chance of dripping into the kiln. Before you go and uh, start turning anything on here, you want to make sure to turn the fan on. So I'm just going to click it a little to the right so that it is on all the way and you should be able to hear the fan blowing or sucking the, the air out. All right, so now we're going to look at the controller. So we'll pretend that it's all loaded up and I mean, with two hands, Lift this, undo that little latch, and gently lower this. Make sure to lower it nice and easily because you're carrying all the weight. There's no springs or anything. And then we'll come over here and look at this controller. So the controller is really fancy and will help you figure everything out. So it tells you the inside temperature. And then there's a little question mark button on all the screens in case you have any questions. But we'll click begin here. 
and we'll click program. And then we can, there are a few different options here, but we can do a guided start if we want extra help. So we'll tell it we're doing ceramics, obviously, we're not doing glass. Next, we are doing a bisque firing. Um, the other options are glaze and preheat only. So we'll do bisque for now, and then we can look at what the glaze and preheat look like. Next, do you want to preheat? And we're going to say yes, one hour. So even though we think that our pieces are bone dry, we don't want to take any risks here of blowing up your pieces and other people's pieces. So we're going to tell it to warm up for one hour, and that's going to make sure to drive off any water uh, that might still be in there after it's already bone dry. So that is just a little insurance policy to make sure that we're being safe. So make sure to click one hour. The $10 price is uh, including that one hour of electrical time. So, and that price is fixed. So make sure to, to do the one hour. And then if your piece is thicker, or extra big, then you'll want to do a longer preheat because there could be water hiding extra deep in it and you want to make sure to give it time to drive that out. It even says that right here, it says choose one hour and press next if you think there may be residual moisture and there are no pieces larger than 18 inches or thicker than a half inch. If there was anything thicker than a half inch or bigger than 18 inches, this is an 18 inch kiln, so that's not very likely, then you click other time and tell it to go longer. But we're gonna just do one hour for now next and then since this is a um a bisque firing for cone six clay we're going to do a cone zero four bisque firing so that's like the cone negative four so the purpose of the bisque firing is to drive off the organics and the water and get the clay started um, to be ready for the glaze firing so it knows that that's what we want so we'll click next and then the speed uh we'll just do a slow speed It'll, this is what it says to do for most bisque firings. It takes approximately 12 hours plus any preheat. Next, and then it says, we're just gonna review it so it'll tell us all the different steps. So it'll estimate it takes about 15 hours. And then that's not including the cool down. So when you put this sign on it, so we'll click start and then it'll just cancel it. So you, you might've been able to hear the relays click on and you'll hear them continue to click on and off as they heat up the oven. Um, and then this also is gonna tell you the temperature and that changes color depending on the temperature. So blue, it's still cool, it's okay. Uh, but once it gets hot, it'll be red and that's letting you know it's really quite hot. Um, I'm just gonna tell it to stop because we don't actually wanna do a firing right now. After you've started the kiln, you wanna put this kiln sign on it and then, we'll, and then you write the date and the time that it'll be cool by which we'll call 24 hours from now. So whenever you start it, you're gonna write the day and the time that it'll be cool, and you can put it on, and that's when people know it's safe to use. So we'll just wipe that off and use the chalk to write the next time. Uh, once it is cool and turned off, uh, so it's under 150 degrees, you take the pieces out, you can use the gloves if you want, then you can turn this fan off so we aren't just you know sucking air out of the room. Then you can take the pieces out and put them onto the fired items to be picked up shelf for either you to then glaze or uh, someone else to pick up and do whatever they want with. The a glaze firing is shorter than the bisque firing. It's about half the time, but it's hotter. So it'll probably also be about 24 hours before everything's nice and cool to be um, ready to be taken out. So even though the glaze firing is shorter, it's still probably safe to put a 24 hour time on the kiln sign so that people know when it's safe to open up the kiln or to get near it. For some notes about doing glaze firings uh, that's sort of separate from bisque firings, you don't want any glaze on the bottom quarter inch of the piece that you're firing. So you need to make sure that you don't have any glaze there because then it would, it would glue itself to the shelf of the cookie. You also don't want to have your pieces too close to the top because if it was too close to the top, then when you go to close the lid, it could be gluing itself to the top of the kiln. So you need to make sure that you leave some space above your pieces as well. When you're doing the glaze firing, so we're gonna again click on program and guided start and then ceramics, we'll click on glaze and then next, we're gonna set it to cone six, which is the high fire. And it even has a note here not to mix up cone 6 with cone 06, which is like a negative sign. So our clay and glazes are 
what are called mid or high fire clays and glazes. So we want to fire them at cone six, not higher and, and not lower for that final glaze firing. Um, so it's important to, to set it to that. Uh, this is also why it's important not to bring in your own clays or other glazes that aren't cone six, because if someone else does a firing and puts your stuff in there, then it's just gonna melt and you'll have a puddle of clay that's ruined some of the kiln. So that's why it's important to make sure everything going in is cone six. So then you would click next and slow, and that's, you know, everything else is the same. All right, so now we're gonna go look at the glazing situation. So for the glazes, let's say you had this cool lizard thing that you wanted to glaze. Uh, what you would do is take the wax resist, which is right up here. This wax resist is ready to be used right out of the jar. You don't have to mix anything or anything like that. We'll just grab the brush for the wax and you're gonna brush it onto your piece, onto the bottom and a quarter inch up around the edges so that when you dunk it in the glaze, the glaze doesn't stick there. The wax will then burn off when it's in the kiln. So in, in that way, we protect the kiln from getting any of the glaze on it, which will be like molten glass and just fuse to it, which you, which you don't want. So we'll just open this up and you can just dunk the paintbrush in there and paint it on. You can wait a minute or two for it to dry. And you can just rinse the brush off in the water and hang it back up on the wall, close the wax back up, you know, and you can, if you have 10 pieces, you can do it to all your pieces. The old method, but you know, before there was wax resist was just to glaze your piece, to dunk it in the glaze and then wipe it off with a sponge. Uh, but that is just more time consuming, maybe fine for one piece, but if you're doing a bunch, it'd be especially annoying. So then once your piece has the wax resist and you've let it dry for a minute, then you want to dunk it in the glaze. You don't want to have your fingers all over it because then it won't, the glaze won't get there. So that's why we have these dunking tools. So here's one dunking tool and you just hold your piece with it, you know, in some gentle way. If you can try to grip onto a spot where it won't, um, you know, won't show, then that's better. And then you just gently dunk it into the glaze. Um, okay. After you after you have put the wax resist on your piece and it's drying for a minute or two, what you can do is mix up your glaze. So we'll just open the glaze and you can see that it's separated out a bit. And so what you want to do is just grab, grab this stirrer stick and mix it all up until it's nice and homogenous again. Okay. So now the glaze is mixed up uh, and, um, and now we can dunk the piece in it. So we'll grab our lizard that has the wax resist that's now dry and we can use these glaze dunking tools. There's two different kinds that we have and you just wanna hold it, you know, maybe in a spot that won't show those little dots from where you're gripping and you'll just dunk it in quickly. You're not trying to get it to soak or anything. You just want to cover your piece. So dunk it in quickly, and then you can put it on the shelf to, to dry for an hour before putting it in to the kiln. So you can just put it on the, the cone six glazed items ready to be fired. Uh, and then in an hour, or if you don't want to do the firing, then you can leave it there with your label uh, and the final weight so that people know when it's going to be fired what the weight is and, and whose it is. In terms of glazes, as I mentioned, you're welcome to bring your own as long as there are cone six glazes. There are also under glazes and oxides and all kinds of cool things to experiment with. And hopefully we'll have little cards that'll show what the different kinds of glazes look like on our clay so that you can kind of know what you might want to get. So when you're done using the glaze, you just want to take this out and wash it off with the sponge in the bucket to make sure that it is nice and clean for hanging back up on the wall. Okay. And then close this back up. Before you put any wax resist or glaze on your piece, you want to weigh it so you know how much to pay for the glaze that you're using. So you can take one of your pieces, all your pieces, put them on the scale, and in pounds, 
uh, measure it, and then you go to makehaven.org slash store and go to glaze, and then you can just put in the weight and it'll charge you $1.50 per pound uh, of the clay that you are glazing. Another tool that we have in the pottery area is our clay recycling slab. So after a bunch of trimmings have collected in this bucket or in your own personal bucket, you might want to reuse them and turn them back into usable clay. Now, bear in mind that this is only good for greenware. Once it's been put it through a bisque firing, that clay is no longer recyclable. But for a greenware that hasn't been fired yet, whether it's wet slip or it's dried, it can be recycled. For the wet slip and the, the stuff that never dried out, you can just keep that in the bucket and then kind of mush it around with your hands until it's one wet mass. For the parts that are closer to being dried, like say this little broken pot here, what you want to do is make sure it dries out completely first and then break it up into smaller parts with your hand or with a hammer and put it into a trimmings bucket, either this one or your own, and let it sit for a few hours or overnight so that that dry clay can become wet again and dissolve into the rest of the trimmings and the slip. It's important to note that this will happen much faster once your pieces of clay are already dry. So if it's still soft to the touch, then it'll take much longer to dissolve than if it's dry. So that's a little counterintuitive, but there you go. You want to make sure your pieces are, are dry and broken up into small pieces before trying to re-dissolve them. So then once it is in your bucket and all dissolved, you know, it looks kind of like this. You can smush it around with your hands, but it's all soft. You want to pour any water off the top. There's no sense in, you know, trying to have extra water to, to evaporate away. So you pour that off the top until you're just left with your slip mass. And then you're going to take that and you're going to put it onto the clay recycling slab. And what is going to happen is the water is going to evaporate off the top and get sucked into the plaster from the bottom. And the bottom is open here, so hopefully that moisture can evaporate. And then, you know, every day or few days, what you can do is turn it over to expose different sides of it to the plaster to help suck the water out. And then hopefully within a few days, you will be left with usable clay again, which you'll bring over to the normal wedging table and wedge until it's nice usable clay again. Some notes for using this. Make sure, you know, this is a community tool, so make sure to use it for no more than one week. And don't forget to label it, so you can just stick a label right here so that we know whose clay is on there. Anything that's left on here past that time will just, you know, either get tossed or donated, be available to anyone who wants it. When you're using the slab, don't use any sharp objects while you're scraping up your, your clay. Using sharp objects could chip up some of the plaster and then the plaster could get into your clay and then your clay will explode when it goes in the kiln. So just nothing sharp on the plaster, we don't want to chip anything on it. And similar to the rest of the pottery area, the only clay that should be used on this to avoid contamination is the white cone six stoneware. And when you're done, please make sure to wipe this off so it's nice and clean for the next person to use. So last is cleaning up of the space. So you're gonna make sure to put everything away, all the tongs, make sure your pieces are labeled uh, and any you know, extraneous stuff is taken care of and put away. Then the floor, you wanna make sure to take the mop and if there's any clay on the floor or dust, you wanna make sure to wet the mop and mop the floor to keep it nice and clean. Uh, and then just squeeze it out in the bucket. So once everything else has been cleaned and the tray and the wheel, the bucket will you know, be all full of the clay and it'll, it'll be like milky because it's all mixed up. But a few hours later, the clay should settle out. And if there's a bunch built up in there, you don't need to do this every time, but you know, if you see that there's some clay settled in the bottom of the bucket, then you can wheel this over to the slop sink and pour out the water off the top and then pour the clay into the trash. So you can begin throw that out. So that is how we're gonna you know, make sure to deal with the clay in there. So that is the basics of using the pottery area. Obviously there's a lot more detail to learn. So you should talk to the facilitators and watch YouTube videos to learn more details and nuanced skills. But hopefully that is enough to get you started. So thank you for watching and I hope you get to make lots of fun stuff.